For those of you guys who missed last week, we are in part two of our series on praying victoriously. Uh, the idea behind this is uh, that I had a, a class last semester that I really enjoyed and, and really challenged me in my prayer life. And I found, honestly, that at the time, while I thought my prayer life was all right, it was really hurting. And I imagine that um, oftentimes we all feel like our prayer life could at least be better or that our prayer life is hurting. So this is our opportunity to really dig deep and understand more about what prayer is and how prayer can help you in your journey of faith. Uh, to start off tonight, I want to tell you a little bit of a story <clears throat> about one of the times that I would say my prayer life died. I think time and again, sometimes our prayer life can die. Several years ago, uh, before my wife Megan and I had our first son, Henry, um, we basically thought that we wouldn't be able to have biological children. And in the midst of praying through that situation, God laid on our hearts this idea of adoption. And um, it was a beautiful picture. I read a, a wonderful book by Russell Moore on adoption, Adopted for Life, and it broke my heart. And I was fully on board. My wife was fully on board. It took us a little while. And and finally, we got our stuff together, and we, we put the paperwork in. We were super excited, and um, it was supposed to take probably six to nine months or so to get a referral, which means that you, you get to have a, a picture of a child, a, a child that is, will be placed in your family that uh, before you have the, the opportunity to, to go, because we, we did international adoption, so we would have gone overseas to Ethiopia and um, be able to pick up the child then months later after that. Well, one thing led to another, and for some reason, uh, things got delayed. And then they got delayed, and they got delayed. And what was supposed to be around six to nine months wait ended up being four years. And based on an awful lot of prayer and an awful lot of running out of finances, because it's a very expensive process, um, my wife and I very sadly had to back out of the program. And in the midst of that time, as you can imagine, nine months, four years, there's a long time between that when you have this expectation. And somewhere in the middle of that, I found myself to just stop praying. Frankly, because it was easier. It was just easier because my heart hurt. It hurt a lot. And it hurt to even think about it, let alone pray about it. And therefore, because I wasn't praying about that, I wasn't praying about a lot of things. In fact, I didn't really want to come to God because I didn't know what he was doing. I would say that during a portion of that time, not that whole time, but during a portion of that time, my prayer life died. It was a rough patch of my life. But I wonder if some of you guys have had moments like that. Maybe it was for an hour. Maybe it was for a minute. Maybe it was for weeks or months on end. But I think a lot of us, in one way or another, we struggle with praying. Maybe we find ourselves to not be motivated to pray at all. Or maybe we find ourselves thinking that I'm just, I don't have the strength to believe that God really cares for me in the situation that I'm in right now. Or maybe we feel like we just don't know how to pray because nobody's ever taught us how to pray, so we just don't. Or maybe you've been in a place where you feel so helpless that you just feel like you can't even cry out to God. I've been in all of those places at one point or another in my life. But I think the real question that we need to ask ourselves is, what do we do when our prayer life has died? How do we get out of that funk, you know? Tonight I want to argue that we are invited by God through the Holy Spirit to rely on the Holy Spirit to help us pray from our hearts. Not just to say words that are empty to God, but to really dig down deep and pray from our hearts. This is true in four ways, at least, that we're going to explore tonight. The four things are on your sheet of paper for you. They are the Holy Spirit motivates us to pray. The Holy Spirit also gives us strength to trust God. The Holy Spirit guides us in prayer. And the Holy Spirit also helps us when we don't know how to pray. 
So first off, I want to talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit motivating us to pray. I often ask myself the question, do I really expect something to happen when I come before God and I lay down a prayer at his feet? Do I really expect him to answer it? And the truth is, is some, sometimes I just don't. I might feel like it's impossible. But most often you're going to hear people say that you're supposed to pray because it's important. Or you're supposed to pray just because it, it's a good thing to do or you ought to do it. But the truth is, I believe that there is more to it than that. I think God actually instructs us to pray in the Holy Spirit. And I see that in several places of Scripture, too, I'll mention now. First, we see in the book of Jude, verses 20 and 21, a call to persevere. And he says this, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. We see it in another place in the midst of Ephesians 6. Many of you guys recognize those verses as the armor of God. But the Apostle Paul tells us specifically, pray at all times in the Spirit. We all remember pray at all times, but sometimes we forget that we're to pray in the Holy Spirit. So what is the Holy Spirit? John chapter 14, verses 16 and 26, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit, the translation is a helper. A helper. Someone who aids us. One who is to come alongside us and help. So that begs the question, how exactly does the Holy Spirit help us? There's a story that I read in a book about a gentleman by the name of John Hyde. He was a missionary in India for a long while, and he was known as Praying Hyde. He held these prayer conventions, and there's a story at one of these prayer conventions of a Christian who was crying out to God to give him a heart to love other people. And at the same time, he was bemoaning about his own cold and hardened heart. While he's doing this, this friend comes up to him and rebukes him, and he says, why are you looking at your poor self, brother? Of course your heart is cold and dead, but you have asked for the broken heart of Jesus. His tears. Is he a liar? Has he not given you what you asked for? Then why look down away from his heart to your own? So what was this guy's problem? His problem was he was not depending on the Holy Spirit to be his motivation for prayer. He was depending on himself. You see, we will make progress when we first come to God and we confess that in our own strength, we are indifferent, we are critical of others, we are, in fact, apathetic oftentimes. We just don't care. But we need to trust the Holy Spirit to produce in us this fervency just like Christ had, and this compassion just like Christ had. Look at an example of Christ in Luke twenty two forty four. It says, And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Can you imagine praying so hard that you are sweating blood? How do we let the Holy Spirit motivate us to pray? Several ways. The first thing you can do is you can respond to the Spirit as he reveals a need in your life or a need in somebody else's life. If the Holy Spirit convicts you and says, hey, you know what, I know that you need something or I know this friend of yours really needs something. Take that moment right then and there to pray, to pray in the Holy Spirit for yourself, for that person. The second thing you can do is you can acknowledge the fact that you can't meet this need on your own. If your friend's dad is out of work and he needs a job, can you get him a job? I'd say 99 times out of 100, you don't have the power to give that guy a job, unless any of you guys out there are wealthy business owners that I don't know about. We need to acknowledge the fact that it is out of our control and it is only in God's control and we need the Holy Spirit. And then the third thing we do with that is, is we repeat it. And we let that be a continual attitude that we keep. 
So what should we do when our prayer life is dead? We are invited to rely on the Holy Spirit to help us pray from our hearts. The second thing is that the Holy Spirit gives us strength to trust God. Let's admit it, oftentimes in our life, we don't have the strength and our own power to be able to trust God because of the challenging circumstances that are going on in our lives. But the truth is that faith is the main target in this spiritual battle in every single believer's life. We are to, told in Ephesians 6.10 to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Not our own might, but his might. Romans 4.20 says that Abraham grew strong in his faith. This literally means he was being strengthened to believe. I think oftentimes when we pray, we pray weekly. By that, I don't mean like every week. I mean, we are weak, like not strong, but weak. We pray weekly and we pray without conviction. We pray without expectation, like God's actually going to answer the prayer. Or we pray without passion because we're just doubtful. Yet God speaks this in his word in Luke 17, verses 6 and 7. And the Lord said, If you had faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Guys, a mulberry tree is like a 600-year-old gigantic tree with super deep roots. Okay? This is an absolutely crazy picture of picking up this gigantic tree and throwing it in the ocean. Why would you plant something in the ocean? He's talking about this because it's impossible. There's no way that you could do that, but he's saying God could do the impossible if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, one of the tiniest seeds known to man. Yet over and over in the Bible, we see examples of the impossible becoming possible. Because of not our strength or the strength of characters in the Bible, but because of the strength of God. For instance, Abraham and Sarah, they have a child when they're like 100 years old, way past childbearing years. Moses parts the water for the Israelites. Insane. Impossible, right? But he does it. Daniel survived a night's in a lion's den. How many people can say that? I think he might be the only one with his hand up on that one in all of history. David stands up to Goliath and takes him down. The Bible is full of these. These are just a few minor examples off the top of my head. And yet we still struggle to pray in the power of God. You see, God's honor tonight is at stake. And he will graciously work through those who have faith in their hearts. What does the Lord desire for you to believe him for today? I want you to depend on the Holy Spirit to give you strength to believe God as you seek him. Believe God in trusting the Holy Spirit to guide you. So when our faith and our prayer life feels dead, we're invited to rely on the Spirit of God to help us pray from the heart. The third thing is the Holy Spirit guides us in prayer. Cool story just from uh, the past week or two here. Um, I talked with uh, Larry this week, Larry Wren, who uh, works down in the academy, and um, I was talking with him about this retreat coming up that we're doing Snowblast because he's going to be our guest speaker. And one of the cool things is, is that I didn't know this before I talked to him, but before Tracy Meyer had asked him to speak, he had actually been praying that God would give him opportunities to speak. And in fact, just after he prayed that prayer, the men's ministry asked him to do something earlier this week, and Tracy contacted him to do Snowblast. And you know what? It's amazing how God works. God answered his prayers very specifically. And then on top of that, Somehow, God prompted Tracy Meyer and whoever was in the men's ministry to reach out to Larry and ask him to do these events. It is amazing how the Holy Spirit works. But you see, true prayer starts with God and the prayer burden that he places on our heart. You see, God placed that prayer burden on Larry's heart. But we must communicate to the Holy Spirit because he is the one who helps us share our real, true concerns with God our burdens, and our desires. 
One of my professors uh, this past semester gave a really good example of what this might look like practically in our lives, something that he chose to do a while back. What he mentioned uh, in one of his books that he wrote to us is, or had us read, was that he had this time of his life when he was feeling like things just were a little bit dry when he would go to church on Sunday morning, and it just wasn't feeling, just wasn't feeling it, okay? Didn't really want to be there, was just kind of going through the motions, if you will, okay? And he sought the Lord on this, and the Lord convicted him, and this conviction was this, to never have a Sunday, the Lord's day, in which he would not seek the heart, his own heart with God. Specifically, what he ended up doing was he would take that week before and he would write down the three greatest concerns of his own heart. He would write them down, he would pray over them, he would think about them, he would finalize his list on that Saturday night before Sunday, and then Sunday morning, he would lift those concerns up to God and Sometimes it was an upcoming responsibility that he had. Sometimes it was maybe a relationship issue that he was dealing with or something like that. Um, and sometimes it was maybe a temptation. But he would write down any insight that God gave him in response to that request as he was sitting in church that Sunday morning. And then what he would do at the end of the week is he would review it. And then he would put it in a filing cabinet. And to most people who would look in that filing cabinet and see those things, those little sheets of paper would be completely worthless. But to him, they meant everything. They meant that it was a reminder to him that there is a true God, a living God who knows him very intimately and he knows each of us very intimately and he's also willing to be a part of our lives and answer our prayers. So what does it look like to sense the leading of the Holy Spirit or guidance from the Holy Spirit in our life? Well, if you're like me, there are probably times in your life where you feel like it's a burden to pray. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I just am not feeling it. There's a lot to pray for. I'm telling you, especially as a pastor on staff here, we get prayer requests that come in constantly. And, and every Tuesday we sit down and we pray through all these prayer requests. And some of them are really deep and really challenging requests that just break your heart. And the truth is, is that sometimes I struggle going through that because these people are dealing with some really, really tough things. And I'm dealing with some tough things in my life. Some of you guys respond with prayer requests and those are, are oftentimes really challenging to read through those and just my heart just breaks for all of you as well. And one thing I've realized is that God doesn't necessarily lead me to pray for every single thing with the same kind of passion and equal intensity. Because truthfully, if I prayed with everything, with the entire intensity of my heart, I would burn out so fast. That's just the honest truth. And all of us would. Because these are heavy burdens that we carry. They're heavy burdens that our friends and families carry. Instead, I believe we need to learn to let God set the agenda of our prayer life. We need to lean on the Holy Spirit. In fact, Psalm 62, 8 says, Trust him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is our refuge. You see, we must understand and recognize that God will not give every single one of us every single prayer burden that is out there. There's too much to pray for. But instead, it's up to us to come to God, to surrender ourselves, and to let him place on our hearts the prayer burden that he has for us. Another interesting story. As I was praying about what our SWAT mission trip would be this coming summer, I was praying really hard because I, I really didn't feel like any of the leads that I had had were, were things that God was really calling our youth group to. And then, for whatever reason, as I was praying, I just felt God's leading to give a call to uh, Steve and Chris Tice, who run Canadian Adventure. And we had talked, oh, maybe three years ago about the possibility of SWAT coming, but I hadn't really thought about it again since. And yet, what happened was, after the Spirit prompted me to think of them and, and call them, just earlier that week, I found out that Steve and Chris were praying about having a group come in and help them with some projects 
because they were looking around camp saying, boy, if we just had one group of about 25 or 30 people in one week, man, we could accomplish so much and this place would be looking great. Guys, that is not an accident. That is what you call the Holy Spirit working through prayer. That is amazing. It's amazing. And this kind of stuff happens all the time. Do we recognize these things in our lives? I don't want you to think, though, that every single time I pray, something incredible happens. All of you probably be knocking at my door, banging the door down, saying, hey, pray for me, pray for me, because something's going to happen, right? That doesn't happen every time. In fact, I would say most of the time, absolutely nothing happens. And sometimes that can be a little bit challenging. Sometimes it makes it feel like God doesn't hear us. Sometimes it makes us feel like God doesn't care. But that's not the truth. What should we do, though, when we pray and we pray and we pray and nothing happens? I think one of the problems is, is that our society is addicted. They're addicted to noise and they're addicted to their phones. That's just the truth. Think about it. Say you're waiting in line at the grocery store or some other store. What are you doing? On your phone. Now, I know that none of you text and drive. If you do, but how many of you, when a stoplight comes, you can't even wait for it to turn green and you pull out your cell phone and start dinking around with it? I see that all the time when I look at people around me. Guys, we can't stand silence. But here's the thing. How do you expect to hear from God, to hear an answered prayer from him, when you're not even paying attention? We can't stand silence. We're addicted to noise. We're addicted to obedience, or excuse me, addicted to busyness. But you know what? Even when we're at school, and this, this was the same, honestly, Years ago when I was in college and I would walk through the campus at UW Oshkosh, and for some of you guys walking around your school campus, oh, I got three minutes between class, or I got five minutes between class, earbuds in, headphones on, music on, go. How many people walking down the hallways of your school do that? 50%? 75%? More? I saw that all the time on the college campus because you know what? That five-minute walk from my dorm to class, whew, can't, can't live with a little bit of time between me and God or I can't live with a little bit of silence. It's got to be filler. It's always got to be filler. Why do we do that to ourselves? In fact, I think that maybe this is exactly why we don't hear from the Holy Spirit. It's because we're not paying attention. We don't give him any time. And I want you to note the link between the desire of the heart and prayer. If your desire of the heart is to be on your phone, if your desire of your heart is to be listening to your music over talking with God, then good luck praying because you know what? It's not going to be fulfilling to you and you're not going to want to do it. But if the desire of your heart is to want to see answered prayer, if the desire of your heart is to know God more and you pray, the Holy Spirit will lead you. What should we do when our prayer life has died? You're invited to rely on the Holy Spirit to help us pray from the heart. Finally, the Holy Spirit helps us when we don't know how to pray. I have to admit that there has been a very small number of occasions in my life where I've come to a point where I needed to pray, whether it was for myself or for someone else. And I just physically couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. All I could do was cry. Maybe some of you have done that before too. I remember one event very vividly, and I won't go into details, but it was a student who lost a parent. And I was at the funeral. I asked him if I could pray for him. And then I just stood there and I cried with him. There are some moments that I think Romans 8, 26 and 27 teaches us about how the Holy Spirit can help us in moments like that. It says, In the same way, the Spirit also joins to help in our weakness. 
because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. And he who searches the hearts knows the Spirit's mindset because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You see, as we lean on the Spirit's motivation uh, for us to pray, the enablement and the guidance, there will sometimes be times of special weakness, no matter how polished you are at praying or how often you pray, where you just aren't going to be able to find the words. This is when the Holy Spirit helps. But what is the worst thing that we can possibly do when we sense this weakness of not knowing really how to pray how we should. I think oftentimes we're tempted to pretend like we can pray. I like this quote. I, it's anonymous. I don't know who said it, but I think it's profound. It says, And when you pray, let your heart be without words rather than your words without heart. If you are going to pray, pray with your heart. Don't pray like the Pharisees just to make yourself look good. Pray with your heart. If you don't understand this, it'll be very easy to get bitter. Because sometimes God seems to be indifferent when we pour out our desires to him. 2 Corinthians 12, 7-10 says this, Therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, This is the Apostle Paul speaking. A messenger of Satan to torment me so I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power may reside in me so that I take pleasure in weakness, insults, catastrophes, persecutions, and in pressures because of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, the Apostle Paul asked God to remove this thorn in his flesh, but God didn't answer his prayer by removing it. But that doesn't mean God didn't answer his prayer. God answered his prayer to a much deeper desire of Paul's. God allowed Paul to know God's grace and power in order to be the most useful servant that Paul could be for God. You see, the Holy Spirit is our helper in prayer. We need him. We can't do even prayer. We can't do on our own. We can do nothing without Christ and the Holy Spirit. So let us look to motive him to our motivation to pray. Let us look to the Holy Spirit to empower us to believe God. Let us look to the Holy Spirit to guide our prayers. And finally, let us look to the Holy Spirit to submit to God in our humility and weakness so that he can pray our hearts to God. What deep desire is the Holy Spirit pleading to God for you? Is there a longing in your heart that is seemingly not being answered by God tonight? Could it be that it's because God is desiring to grant you an even deeper longing and an even deeper desire of your heart? 